This is the Hard Thing Podcast. Today, we are overcoming average. Welcome back to the Hard Thing Podcast. I'm your host, Justin Lewis, and this is the podcast that helps you win the war on average in your daily life by doing hard things. We're here to help you get over the metaphorical obstacles in your way so you can have a better life and be a better person. We're going to give you the tips, tricks, tools, tactics, techniques, teachings, really whatever you need in order to do those hard things, overcome average, and have the life that you want to have. Today's our Monday show, so you are going to hear from me and a high-powered guest who has done some really hard things and some some really interesting things as well, and we're going to get some insights from them. Uh, today, I have an excellent guest on the show. Her name is Jennifer Benson. She is an author. She uh, also lived in the Middle East for a while as an expatriate teaching English. Uh, she also survived the tsunami in Thailand in 2004. So really interesting conversation, really insightful. She's also just super adventurous. So I'd really like you to key in on that, that aspect. Hopefully it will help you break down some of your limitations and take the leap as she does. So listen up to my conversation with Jennifer Benson. All right. Well, thank you for being on my show, Jennifer. I'm excited to have this conversation. Hi, Justin. Thank you so much for having me on today. I am very excited as well. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, let's start the show, like always, uh, with the question I ask all my guests. Jennifer, what's the hardest thing you've ever done? I believe it would be back in uh, around the year 2000, 2001, when I was um, a teacher in upstate New York. And I think I was really struggling with where I was and being quite unfulfilled and living in some pretty stagnant water, I guess, so to speak. Um, and I guess I just happened to come across an opportunity to teach abroad and to teach not only abroad, but to teach in the Middle East um, and international school in Kuwait. So I think um, jumping, taking that leap off, off, off the cliff and um, you know, going to move over there to live abroad and to work, I think that was probably the hardest, but also the best thing that I've ever done. Wow. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I want to dig into that because that is something that I can imagine a lot of the listeners probably wouldn't see themselves doing. So walk us through a little bit about kind of you said you were feeling unfulfilled. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that and, and why you were feeling unfulfilled and why this came and, and seemed like such an opportunity. Well, it was around, I'd love to, it was around the age of 30, you know, um, I, I was in a 12 year relationship with a, an old boyfriend from college that I met and it really obviously wasn't going anywhere. Um, and then not only that, but it was just my job. I had started a new teaching job and it was extremely stressful, which really actually made me think, do I even want to do this anymore? So I was at this standstill in my life where I was trying to figure out what the next steps would be. And I'm like, okay, is this as good as it gets? You know, I um, tended to really view life um, just from that space of not being fulfilled and just wondering what you know, my purpose was. And all of a sudden, my sister had um, been overseas. She had been working in Kuwait for about a year and she was sending home these amazing postcards and these pictures of trips to Dubai and camel rides and dinner under the stars and tents. And um, I just felt more alive. And I just thought, okay, this could be something. And when an opportunity came up at her school, I had this choice of taking the leap or staying behind. And I think that's kind of how I, I looked at it. Like, okay, I had this opportunity from the universe. Now, what am I going to do with it? Right. Yeah. Uh, digging in a little bit more into kind of before, because a lot of my audience, I would assume, has, well, actually everyone has been in moments where they're feeling listless. They don't have any direction. They're kind of, you know, they're kind of just lost. Uh, right. What, what advice would you give to them when they find themselves in that situation and they don't really know what to do? Well, you know, I, you know, I've been working on, you know, just my story about how I've followed, and I got this phrase from Louise Hay, um, our old inspirational motivator from back in the 80s and 90s. And so I, she has this expression, follow your inner ding. So my inner ding kind of picked up. It's like my inner antenna. It's like my inner guidance system. You could say, God, the universe, something informed me. And, and I kind of informed myself that something was not working. So I asked the universe for signs. And, and I'm like, okay, if I'm supposed to change, make a change, do something different, I need to know what that is, because I'm not quite sure if I know. 
And then all of a sudden, within a few months, that opportunity came to me. So the signs were there. And then the opportunities come, you know, started coming. So I'm, it's like, if you knock, <laughs> the door will open. So I think one of the biggest things is just to acknowledge that and to be aware that we're unfulfilled and that something's not right. And maybe ask the universe, ask your inner self, maybe through silent meditation, prayer, I mean, whatever. A lot of my inspiration came when I was driving to work with nothing on, no radio, nothing. Um, You know, those silent times where you can hear that inner voice and Mm -hmm. saying, okay, all right, universe, this is not working. What do I need to do? And then the opportunity, there was a job opening in my field at the school in Kuwait. So then I asked for more signs. I'm like, okay, this is my opportunity. Is this meant for me? And then you listen and you watch for the signs as they come. And then those things, it just kind of fell into place. My school ended up giving me a year leave in Casanova in upstate New York. And I was so, I was just so happy. And, And that happiness really is another good sign. So not only asking the universe for signs, but look, listen to your body and how your, your body is feeling. My body was excited. And the thought of staying behind felt almost suffocating. So there was a couple different ways right there. (laughs) I really like what you said about taking moments of silence and and calmness, solitude. Recently, I I went on a a vacation with my wife. And prior to that vacation, she had challenged me to, you know, stay away from like games on your phone, you know, like little things like that. And so this whole vacation, uh, you know, I was kind of forced to stick away from podcasts, stick away from doing other things. And that gave me a lot of interesting moments of silence, solitude, and thinking, because often she would go to sleep early and I would be like sitting awake, you know, like restless. And and you really start to consider different things that you'd never thought. And you have these like weird thoughts and you're like, wait a second, you know? So I I really like that you said that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, just a different, if you can, like, if I could turn the music off in my car and just, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to go and just li- 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 like, listen to the universe in silence on my way to work in the shower. Yeah. It doesn't even necessarily have to be in a meditative state. I think right. it can come to you or walk outside in nature. There's a lot of different ways where I pick up. It's like my antenna is more open, you yeah. know, and I can receive more guidance when my, I'm a little bit more quiet and still. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I'm curious how do you differentiate a sign versus something just happen? You know what I mean? Like, like how, right. how do you follow the trail of events versus just jumping to conclusions? Well, you know, it almost seemed too easy for me when this whole thing happened. I was asking for signs within a, like a month. My sister's like, Oh, we have openings over here. And, and one of them is for a reading teacher. Uh, you know, so then I'm like, oh, but they do a two year contract. I'm not comfortable with that. I need another sign. And then just keeps falling into place. So then I asked, um, once I was offered the job, I send in my resume. I'm like, okay, if I get it, that's a sign. And I got it. So then I asked the um, director of the school, can I do only a one year instead of a two year? She's like, yep, I'll send you the contract. Then I asked my school for a one year leave, like a sabbatical. I wasn't even tenured yet. And they'd ask the school board and they said, yes, it's just like everything starts lining up. And then, like I said, you listen to your body, you get the feelings of excitement and you're curious. And, you know, and the biggest thing, too, that I didn't understand back then, but now I see it very clearly is that I didn't know if I obviously I'd stayed for more than one year. I ended up staying 13 years, but. I didn't know that at the time. So I didn't need to know that it was all going to be I didn't have to have a guarantee that it was all going to work out. I took this leap. I was excited. All the pieces started lining up. I asked for signs. I was given the signs, but I didn't need to know how steps A through Z were going to work out. I just knew that I was going to go over for one year. That's all I knew. And even then I didn't know how it was going to work out. So I was just willing to take that chance and that risk, you know? So I think, yeah, those, those signs start coming in. And when things start lining up easily, when you start feeling excited, when you start getting more of those green lights from the universe where, you know, this is all right, this is starting to really align, then you know, at least for me, that this is where I'm meant to go. And I never would have envisioned this crazy lifestyle for myself when I was younger. (laughs) It's just something new that the universe thought, hey, let's all right, Jennifer, let's just go this direction. This is going to work out for you. Just trust me. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny you say green lights. One of my 
previous conversations these last couple of weeks was with a guy named Nelson Trestle. And we, we talked about this concept of, you know, green lights and, and not, not having to have like the full long road of green lights, just, you know, just looking at the first one that's right in front of you, whether or not that's green. And I, I think so often, like we, we paralyze ourselves thinking, like you said, we need to know A to Z rather than thinking, I'll just go with like, the next opportunity, the next step, right. kind of being fluid and, and, and very flexible that way. And, uh, and actually, even with, you know, finding my wife before I found her, I, uh, <laughs> I kind of had this fixation on being in a relationship and things like that. It was, it was, it was kind of damaging. And then finally, I just had this mm -hmm. mental shift of like, you know what, I'm just going to go on a date. And if I like it enough to go on a, uh -huh. a next one, you know, I'll just take the next step. And I think that's very much what you yeah. did. You just kind of like, okay, I'll go to the next opportunity. So that's really fascinating to me. Yeah, good, yeah. good. I, well, great. I also wanted to ask, you said it was an opportunity and you had to take the leap. So what, like, that's something so many people struggle with. Like, yeah. how, how did you actually just, you know, even even send in your resume or or, you know, take that first step? What made you do it? Right. Well, you know, when you send that resume in, you kind of leave it up to the universe, you know, and you're like, okay, if I get this offer and if it gets accepted, then I'll worry about it. So then you get this offer and then I'm like, okay, right away, what does my gut tell me? What does my heart tell me? And if I had listened to my mind, my brain, or whatever you want to say, I probably wouldn't have done it because the Middle East, we hear things all the time on the TV about the Middle East. And just, you know, I think if I thought about it, we, you know, like I said, using my, my brain and not my heart, I probably would have been held back. And then you also get into the whole realm of listening to friends and family that are you crazy? Why would you ever want to go over there? Are you crazy? I mean, all the teachers, like you can imagine, most of them could not fathom what is wrong with your parents for letting you. I mean, I heard everything, but you know, there was just something, like I said, when things start aligning. I went for it with my heart. I'm like, this is just actually way too easy. And if I stay here, I am in this job. I'm in this relationship. Things are not working. I do not want more of that. I need some type of a change, no matter what it is, even if it's for one year, I'm going to try it and I'm going to give it a go because I don't want to regret it down the road. And that was another thing that I noticed. If I don't do this, I have a feeling I'm going to regret it. And I didn't need to have the guarantee. I just knew that, okay, I got to get my shots. I got to get my paperwork done. I have to have a bunch of other things done. I got to send in some copies of paperwork, but I'll take it step by step. That was all I can do. And then, and the fact that I was excited, I just kind of went with it. Yeah. Well, well, that's, that's fascinating. So it does sound like there was still pressure and there was still difficulty along the road. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and yeah. the ease wasn't so much of like doing it all together, but it was just moving to the next step. It seemed like everything fell in line. Yeah. And there's also times when you make these big decisions in life, I think too, there is some sacrifice involved. You know, I mean, the boyfriend and I, I remember telling him and he's like, you won't do this. I know you, Jenny, you're not going to do this. Uh, you know, and then eventually what happened is I am doing it. <laughs> You know, in 12 years I've given, you know, but I think also there is that sacrifice of that. I had to sacrifice that relationship. He ended up moving out to Boston and he's never looked back. He's happy. So it worked out for him as well. But like I said, there, you know, when you have this big decision in your lap, there is going to be some second guessing. There is going to be some sacrifice. There might be some, you know, um, difficult moments, but at the same time, for me, the pros outweighed the cons. And that's kind of what I had to keep going with, you know, even though this and this is happening, I really do feel from my heart that this is the right path for me just because of all the events lining up so easily and just being excited about it. You know, even though there's some sadness, challenge and some change, I'm still going to go forward with it. I can't let that keep me back, you know? Yeah. I think <clears throat> with certain decisions in life or, or certain activities or w what have you, we all sometimes feel like this pull or this push to get there. And, and yeah. you know, sometimes I feel like in those instances, the challenges, they kind of like brush off us, you know, they, they like fall to the wayside and it's really fascinating. And, and I want to know like why in the world, like what's the difference between that and, and us wanting to do something that we wanted to do, but like we don't feel like that, that pull or push, you know what I mean? 
Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah. I definitely felt that push. And like I said, staying behind, I heard this expression, stagnant water stinks. And I'm like, yep, yeah. <laughs> there was no stopping me. I didn't care what anybody said. I just knew I had to do this at least for one year. And that was all I knew. Yeah. 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 Before we move on in your timeline, I want to kind of transpose your story into to the lives of our viewers. Like for someone who is contemplating starting over or, or taking a big leap, what are a couple of recommendations you might give them in contemplating this or executing it? Like I said, I think the big thing for me, I had to start over twice. Once, you know, going to overseas and making that leap and then making the leap back home again to um, New York after 13 years. So both times, there were times when I did allow myself to have that silence throughout the day. And if it was like even a five minute silence, you know, during a lunch break, it would be a silence on the way to work. It would be a walk, like I said, outside. Even when I was in the Middle East, I found time to walk and I went outside and I would even go down by the Gulf and take walks by the Gulf and just to clear my head and to allow that inspiration to kind of come into me and that guidance. So I would suggest getting some quiet time. Um, being outside in nature works for me, uh, and that's how I find my my spirituality. It's how I feel closest to the universe, I guess that's what I want to say. So for me, finding quiet time, being out in nature, and asking for signs and really looking for them. And I don't think it's necessarily so much, oh, this is just a coincidence. I think those are real signs from the universe telling, trying to help us because I do believe the universe has our back and wants the best for us. So listening for the signs, asking for the signs, being out in nature, having that alone time. And I think it all eventually starts to line up and to not put the pressure on yourself to have that guarantee where I need a guarantee that this is going to work out. Because no matter what we decide, we're going to learn something, you know, and it's going to evolve us and push us to the next best, greatest thing in life. So no matter what, it's going to work out. I, I do believe that. And if I didn't go over that year, my sister went abroad again, I think about three or four years later, it would have happened down the road, I think, eventually. So there's no missing the boat. <laughs> it's, it's ready. It's docked. It's ready for when you're ready to do it. So I think if it's not this leap, there will be another leap. So there's also that, you don't need that pressure either. Yeah. Right. I, I agree completely on that last point. Like <clears throat> so often growing up, I used to think like that was my only chance. Right. Um, life is, life is way too chaotic and complicated to really believe that, you know, and, and sometimes you do have one chance, but in a more, you know, extended perspective uh you don't have just one chance total so right um, right if it's all right with you I actually wrote those two down as some of the action items we'll yeah. so uh little, yeah. little moments of silence and then asking for signs awesome. i think those are excellent ones um, good so you find yourself in the middle east right <laughs> you're you're somewhere where most americans never dream of going um right what do you do next well, you know, you get there and you have an or just like any type of job, you have an orientation for a week. So they bust you around all these different places. You get to work. You meet all these teachers from the United States and Canada, Canada mainly. You get bussed around to um, to different IKEA and different places to get your apartment set up. They give you an apartment to live in. You don't have to pay for that, which is nice. So you're just meeting people, and they become like your family because your family's back here. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to. Um, get to know people and you're and then eventually you're meeting the kids that you're going to work with and there's kids from all probably about 20 different countries that you're teaching um they're bilingual and arabic and english uh probably from kindergarten and they're just great kids um but you know you are living in a different culture you're living in a culture that's dominated by another religion there's a lot of things that you have to adjust to and especially during ramadan and their um religious holidays so yeah you're just constantly learning you're constantly constantly in an adventure. Um, and you have to be, I learned I had to be quite open-minded more than I usually was. And 
you know, um, and I remember our superintendent saying, you're going to have to adjust your ways of thinking, you're going to have to be more open minded. And you may not after a year or so people may not think this, this might not be the place for you if you cannot be that way. So it, you're forced to really look at yourself and, and say, okay, I can learn to do things a different way. I can learn to see that there are different ways of doing things in the world and mm -hmm. just to meet different people. So I think it was a great learning experience for sure. And there were just so many positives to it that I fell in love with that style of living and I ended up playing for 13 years. Well, so. what were some of the biggest adjustments you had to make? Like I said, I think it was during Ramadan, you know, um, over there during Ramadan, restaurants are closed all day. There's no eating and drinking in public. And, you know, you, um, you are not allowed to do so until the sun goes down. So there was a lot of that adjustment at school. Kids came in a little bit later because they were up later at night. And that's when they did a lot of their gatherings with family and eating and mm -hmm. drinking and things like that. But it's just an adjustment. We had to put black paper over our windows, you know, in our classroom. So if we wanted to drink water or to eat, we had to be completely covered in that regard. We couldn't, you know, be seen and we couldn't drink water or eat out in public. Um, you know, and I think it was just a lot of um, adjustments as far as, oh, the mosque call would go off five times a day and you would always hear that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a lot of different ways. And I actually learned to appreciate a lot of the different customs in the country. Uh, I remember our kids in the middle school and high school, you know, they fasted all day and they didn't drink water. Um, and I actually felt quite a bit of um, compassion toward them and just thinking, wow, that, that would be hard, you know? So there was a lot of different things that I learned about another, not only a culture, but a religion. And it may not be my religion, but I, like I said, I learned to adapt to something new and I learned to be more open-minded and to have, to see different perspectives in the world. So it was good for me. And when right. I came back home, it really serves me well just to be more, I know, empathic toward other people that are different. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. What tips would you give to someone who, uh, uh, close-minded or uh, maybe, maybe not, that's not the right term. <laughs> maybe they're just like, yeah. uh, they, they haven't had exposure. You know what I mean? Yeah. And they want to well, learn how to be empathic and, and tolerant. Well, you know, it's funny because, you know, I think traveling, it's not everyone's cup of tea and I get mm. that, but just getting out and doing things I think that are different than you would normally do. I think there's like a, like a danger in living. I'm a big fan of Dr. Joe Dispensia's uh, work about being stuck in habitu um, habitual patterns every day, you know, and not getting out of our comfort zone. And I think there's a danger associated with that just because I think it keeps us a little bit more in our shells. So just doing, taking risk. I know it's hard during right now during COVID because I'm, I have, I'm antsy and I want to get out there and, and, see some different things, even go to a museum for goodness sakes, but just getting out there and doing things that are outside our comfort zone every day and not to, and also if you have the chance to travel, if it, whether it's to travel to another city for a football game, it, mm -hmm. it could be traveling to, sometimes I just hop over to Massachusetts and I'll stay for a long weekend just to kind of get a change of pace and right. see different things. So any chance that we can do something different, something that we, that makes us curious about life and also it kind of, exposes us to people from different places and different areas you know and I think mm -hmm. it also strengthens us and gives us a little bit more confidence about who we are and it's just nice to see different perspectives because we're like oh my goodness I guess I'm not the only one that thinks that way or oh my gosh there is more than one way to act and be you know yeah. like wow oh in this city they serve they have these kind of restaurants I never knew that you know it's just expanding our knowledge and broadening our perspective and being more open-minded I think all those experiences has really lend well to that yeah yeah, yeah. actually uh, about putting yourself out of your comfort zone i i read somewhere <clears throat> there was like a study done where they found that people who try new things were literally creating new neural pathways in their brain and yeah just, just like putting yourself in a new situation is like teaching your brain to think at a higher level at a different level building up your brain uh, and, and also about building confidence, what you said, it, it makes so much sense because if you put yourself in different situations, you have all this proof positive that, uh, you know, Justin in XYZ situation, whatever it is, still came out alive and okay. So you can translate yeah. that to new situations. So I think that's, that's really wise what you said there. <clears throat> oh, good. 
Um, so you're teaching, you're having a good time. At, at one point, <laughs> did you realize that, hey, I think I want to stay here for 13 years? Well, I, I, I was, it's funny because my first year I actually got evacuated for the second Gulf War. Um, oh. Our school was going to send all the, our school initially was going to send all of its teachers to Sri Lanka. There's an island down below India to wait it out. Oh. We're like, uh, okay. <laughs> and then they decided to send us to our point of origin. So my point of origin is Syracuse, New York. So they sent us back home to wait out the war. And with all these shenanigans going on and all this chaos, I'm like, this is still really... <laughs> I don't know. It's just, I wanted to keep doing this. I don't know. I got addicted to the adventure of it or something. But when I came home, I went and saw my school and I said, I'm sorry, but I'm going to give up my job. I'm, I think I meant to go back at least another year. I need to see this through. I'm not ready to give it up. So I went back another year. My sister ended up leaving after my first year. She came back home to New York. There was somebody that replaced her from Canada. I ended up meeting this person, dating this person, uh, getting married married to this person and David, his name is, and we ended up being together for 12 years. And we ended up, like I said, getting married and, and I don't regret a day of it. I loved it. And like I said, we went from Kuwait uh, to Qatar in the Middle East. And yeah, so there's just, we both loved that lifestyle and we were kind of on the same page for the long, the longest time until we were not. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, like I said, after about 12 years of, of that, yeah, we were kind of headed toward different horizons, but, wow. but it was wonderful. Yeah. What, what was it like meeting someone, going through the courtship uh, process and, and eventually marrying them? all in a foreign country, foreign culture, you know? That's a good question. I haven't been asked that question yet. That's a really good question. Well, when you meet somebody, we were just friends for the longest time. Kuwait has a standard of, you may not spend the night at anyone's house when you are married. They have these, all these, these rules that, um, you know, that we, of course we're scared to death, you know, <laughs> you can't drink, it's a dry country. I know some teachers made their own wine, um, but, wow. um, you know, there's always a way to get around it, but, but you kind of dated and it was very secretive. You, you know, when you were out in public, you don't hold hands. It was against custom there. You don't do that. But, you know, I remember one time we were holding hands and walking along the golf and we saw a police officer and he went like this with his finger, like no love, no love. <laughs> so we dropped our hands, you know, right away, you know, yeah. but you know, you know, we, you know, and you go on these trips together. Um, I remember our first trip was to Thailand and, and we end up going doing some diving. And I think those kind of trips really bond you mm -hmm. when you travel with somebody, that's when you really get to know someone, you know, yeah. <laughs> and do enough of those trips. And it was enough to say yay or nay, you know, I think mm -hmm. I got to, you know, after a few years, you know, we're like, yeah, we got engaged and, you know, got married, but yeah, it was a little different being in, in Kuwait because of the, lack of um, public display of affection and you know things like that so yeah it was definitely different so that was a good question <laughs> wow that that just seems so so bizarre and so foreign like <laughs> just curious but like what are the like what are the penalties like what happens if you know they find you smooching with your sweetheart in the back alley you know what i mean oh um well dubai you can look online dubai's got many has many cases dubai's <laughs> one um i mean i wouldn't do that in the most middle eastern countries holding hands is one thing but right. i think especially if you're expat um you know they they're a little bit harsher you I know see. with you and yeah. you know i didn't for the most part i found kuwait to be a lot more laid back than qatar there was a, quite a few things that happened in, in kuwait where i felt a little bit more you know, like, okay, they're not going to do anything. I've had some teacher friends sneak in alcohol from other countries in their mm -hmm. suitcases and they were caught at the airport. Oh my God. And I, I was always thinking, oh my gosh, they're going to go to jail. They're going to go to jail. <laughs> and the guards there, they're just like same thing, shaking their finger. This is very bad. This is mm. very bad. But then they would put it under the shelf. You know what I mean? And they just yeah. like, go on, get yeah. You know, especially if they find out you're American or Canadian, I think you have a little bit more of a pull there, you mm -hmm. know, as opposed to being from a country like in India or mm -hmm. Bangladesh or Nepal. I've seen some things happen there where they don't quite have as much power just because of the country they're from. And it's unfortunate. But thank goodness, though, I think, you know, um, 
you know, so I, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't do that though. I wouldn't sneak it in just because you just never know though. You know, you mm. most of the time you're okay, but you, there could be that one time <laughs> you know, where you get hauled off to jail or deported or, you know, so. Yeah. You mentioned you took a trip to Thailand. Um, right. And this was something I saw in, in learning more about you. Um, one of those trips, I'd assume, you had uh, quite a bit of a surprise in the form of a tsunami, right? Right, right. So, tell 2004. Us about that. Yeah, that was about um, about a year after David and I were dating. <laughs> we went wow. to Thailand, and we went to southern Thailand, and we were on the beach, and we were we were um, David and I were always early risers, so we normally get up at seven. But that particular day, we got up a little bit later, around eight. We headed down to the beach, and we had been kayaking that whole week. Where you go out to these uh -huh. little tiny islands, you know, off to the side and yeah. kayak and eat your chips on the island, and then you come back <laughs> home. But um, we woke up late. We were at a restaurant on the beach, and we saw the waves receding out to the out um, out back out into the water. I, got out, I guess out into the, I don't know how you say it, but the waves were receded back, the boats were stranded and everybody was headed down toward the water to take a better look. And I'm like, what is going on? I thought it was like a beached animal. I thought somebody was hurt, right. you know, but you look at the water and like, well, that doesn't look right. But we didn't know that there was an earthquake and the Thai people had never had an earthquake before or never some tsunami anyway, that right. or had an effect of an of a earthquake there. So everybody just walked down toward it. And I, I probably sent you some pictures of them just walking toward the yeah. water and yeah. receded out. And then behind me, I'm like, this is a, something's not right. This is not right. And behind me, there was these two Thai waitresses and they were holding on to each other and they were crying. It's almost like they knew something bad was going to happen. Wow. So I got the chills. And even now when I talk about it, I get the chills. <laughs> David's over trying to talk to a dive instructor about setting up a dive trip. And then he's taking pictures at the same time. And I'm like, this is not right. And then finally the dive instructor took a moment and she looked out into the water and the first wave was starting to come in. There was three waves consecutively. Uh, the first wave started heading in and she knew right away that it was a tsunami. She was the only one. And she said, run, it's a tsunami, run, you got to get out of here, run, because yeah. the water, like I said, was starting to come in. Yeah. And I don't know what happened, but David and I started running back up the hill where we, our hotel was, thank goodness, we kind of already knew the way, but we ran, I could hear things breaking behind me, I could hear things, people screaming, and I think at one point I told David, I can't, it's like that bad dream where you're running and you yeah. know you're going to like, <laughs> you know, you can't move, your legs are jelly. And he grabbed my hand and just hauled me up the hill because I felt like I was just gonna, it was just gonna over, you know, overtake us, but yeah. we did make it. We wow. made it and there. Um, yeah. So the, thank God for that dive instructor. Thank so, God we woke up late, you know? So, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm I think really... most of the people, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was just saying most of the people, I think there was over 200,000 people that died. And I think mm -hmm. most of them that died were, in Sri Lanka, Indonesia. And if they were in Thailand, a lot of them died when they took these big, these boat trips out to these little islands. Yeah. And when you're out on these boat trips, there's nowhere to go. And that's where I saw a lot of the um, missing person, like missing people posters were from those trips. Damn. Yeah. So yeah, it was, yeah, it was something. <laughs> that's crazy. Cause like, based on what you were telling me, like you would have been out there on any other day doing one of those kayaking yeah. trips, right? Yeah, yeah. I know we would have been already out on one of those little islands kayaking. And then there's, like right. I said, there's nowhere to go. The water would just kind of, but yeah, but like by the grace of God, you know, we made it out. And then we got back to Kuwait and David taught high school math. And one of his kids, the Kuwaiti kids, the father owned a TV show called Starting Over. And he had mm. us on there to talk about the tsunami. So that was another first for us yeah. going on a Kuwaiti show wow. yeah <laughs> um, <laughs> just curiosity about that did you have to speak the language or did they have like an interpreter or? uh for the tv show or yeah, for yeah. for the kuwaiti tv show no they had um People in Kuwait, I find, um, are very bilingual. Mm. And, and uh, the television show producer, the man that owned the show, he spoke fluent English. A lot mm. of them are educated in the States or in Canada or wow. in um, Europe. Yeah. So 
Yeah. And then, and then everyone always asked, did you ever learn Arabic? Because you were there for 13 years. And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's because everything's so bilingual. Mm. Like if you go to a Chili's or an Applebee's over there, they have an Arabic menu and then they have the English menu. Right. The waiters are from the Philippines. They speak fluent English. So they're really, yeah, yeah it's not an easy language yeah. to learn. I know a few phrases and I know some swear words just because of the kids <laughs> at school. Yeah, no, it's- <laughs> you that, have to kind of learn to you. know them you know yeah, yeah osmosis you that's just a like, natural yeah, thing. yeah i pick them up <laughs> easily <laughs> yeah uh, that's awesome I, i'm really glad yeah. i asked you that question about the uh, about hearing your experience with the tsunami because i've always wondered like you know before moments like tsunamis 9-11s you know these these tragedies these poignant experiences do people have like a sense of foreboding or do people kind of get this, like just this chill in the air? You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, when something's not right. I mean, at least I do. Like when I saw the waves going back out and getting sucked out, I'm like, that is not normal. And then, uh, then you start picking up on clues around you that kind of confirm what you were thinking the mm-hmm. waitress is crying you know the boats being stranded people scratching their heads you know walking down toward the water and i'm like are you crazy get away from there something yeah. is not right i couldn't stand it i couldn't yeah. even stand the look i knew that all right something's gonna happen i don't know what it is i didn't know there was an earthquake but you know and like i said once your antenna is out you start picking up on things very easily around you. Yeah. Well, hopefully none of us go through any experiences like that ever again. Yeah. Um, but is, I will say, yeah. yeah, once you go through it, Justin, you you realize I can handle anything that comes my way. Once yeah. you go through it, you survive it. I'm like, if I handle that, there's nothing. I can't handle in life, wow. you know, so it does make you quite strong. Yeah. That's really fascinating. Cause uh, have you ever read the book, uh, David and Goliath by Malcolm Gladwell? Yeah, I have. I have a lot of his books actually. Yes. Yeah. I've yeah. read that about, yeah. So that's exactly the principle uh, he talked about with the bombing in, in, in Britain uh, where, you know, you had uh, a miss, I guess, where you were in the city yeah. technically, right? You didn't, you didn't die from the tsunami. Um, so that just strengthened your belief that, Hey, I can survive and do difficult things because I survived. Just right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that, that's yeah. really interesting that, you know, a, a live example standing in right before me. <laughs> yeah. I also like his other book blink about mm-hmm. becoming an, I think it's blink about becoming an expert in your field and doing some, I, I yeah, he's pretty motivational, yeah. but yeah, you're right. Once you go through these hard things, you think you can't do them, mm-hmm. but then you do them. And then the big, the biggest thing in life is that I can handle anything I already have. There's nothing that I haven't handled in my life and it will always be that way. No. <clears throat> so based on what I've, I've heard about you you're very adventurous you go you know from here to there <laughs> all sorts of things um were you always adventurous and if not like where did it start and I'm asking from the point of view like our listeners might not be super adventurous but they might idolize that lifestyle and want to get into it so like how how does that happen well, when you have an adventurous friend or a sibling, my sister was my kind of my catalyst. So, you know, you never know where it's going to come from. But my sister was my catalyst. And probably I think around 1998, she wanted to do this backpacking trip. We were both teachers and we were in New York and we were going to go to Italy and France. And I had never flown before. So I went down to JFK in New York City, took a Pakistani airline to France to meet up with my sister and her friend. And we did this two week trip of, of uh, going on the Euro rail. And when you do these crazy, strange things that your parents are like, oh, you know, about it, Mm -hmm. it changes you. Um, You know, we were there. We didn't even know it. We were so oblivious at the time. We got to France and they were having the 1998 World Cup. Oh, gosh. uh, Final (laughs) final match between France and Brazil. 
And we were in this city oh and we're gosh. like, why are all these people here? <laughs> we didn't even yeah. figure it out. I had yeah. we knew it was soccer, but that that city was infiltrated to the mm-hmm. maximum. Mm-hmm. And I remember getting pickpocketed in um, Paris. It was back when you had the paper airline ticket. I had yeah. to buy a new airline ticket to go home. But I look back on that trip and my mom picked us up at the airport and she goes, you two look different. You look different. I don't know what happened, but you do not look the same. And, you know, she knew that I think something happened within us that we stepped out on this once again, stuff, you know, stepped out off this cliff, took this leap and did these, this crazy thing. And I think these, there are moments in our lives where these things, these events come into our, you know, into play. And then when we act on them and we take these risks, we're never the same. You, there's no going backwards after these things happen because you are forever changed. And that's kind of what happened with me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that, that's so cool. I just, uh, I'm, I'm a huge, uh, nerd. I love like fantasy novels, fiction novels, sci-fi novels, and I love a good hero's journey story, you know, setting out on some sort of adventure, coming back a different person. And, and that's like one key element of a hero's journey is stepping into the unknown, conquering some beast and then returning home with the spoils and sharing that. And in this case, the spoils are just the fact that you changed as a person, you leveled up, you evolved and you come home and people, it's palpable. People can tell, people feel that about you. Right. And it sets the stage, I think, for future events, Mm -hmm. because that trip, once that gets into your blood, when you get, when you (laughs) take on that risk, you take on that journey, you take on that adventure, your blood is different. I know it sounds crazy for saying that, but there's something different within you and you are vibrating on a higher level. And then these other crazy things start lining up into your life where I got this opportunity now to work abroad. And I, you know, and if I didn't already take that first trip, the second time I might've said no, right. same with my sister. She might've said no. So everything is always aligning to get us to that higher level, to our more authentic self, but we don't realize it at the time. But when we right. look back on it, you're like, oh my gosh, it's so clear, yeah. you know? Yeah. <laughs> Have you seen the movie, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty? No, I haven't. Oh, I haven't got, even seen that. You got to see that movie. It's a, it's a Ben Stiller movie. It's like super kind of unknown, but uh, really right. good. Uh, the basic story okay. is Ben Stiller works at this company. He actually works at Life Magazine, and he's the guy who like takes all the photos that the photographers bring in, and he he helps compile them and and like take care of them. And at okay. one point, basically the whole story is a photographer sends him you know this photo that's supposed to be the greatest photo ever, and he loses it. So he has to go find the photographer, but that takes him like to Iceland, to the Himalayas, to all these places. And he, he like has this full adventure and he like becomes this whole different person and, and like kind of your story oh, seems wow. very similar to that. And just like, you know, and I guess maybe everyone's story is similar to that. And like you take one step out and just be careful because like one step leads to two steps and, and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. And you see it so much. And I've heard of the book, actually, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. I have heard of it. But you're, you don't know where your steps are going to lead you. So then and there's in your mind, you're worried about how this is all going to play out. Yeah. But you really don't have to worry because we don't need to know the how. The universe starts arranging things and, and doing things. And it just kind of opportunities come out of nowhere. And then you just act on them, you know, yeah. once you feel the moment is right. So, yeah, you're never the same again. Yeah. You really aren't. Um, I, I know we have a little bit of time left, so I want to move on and talk about, you, okay. said, you said you started over twice, uh, 13 years in the Middle East, and then you have this another moment where you need to start over. Walk us through that. Right. Well, I remember that moment very clearly. I was in a little tiny Indian restaurant in uh, Qatar on my 40th birthday. It seems like these big 30, 40th birthday are these times you have these big aha moments, at least for me. And I'm like, what the heck am I doing over here? I was teaching (laughs) at a, and I say this with love, it was a naughty boy school. In Qatar, I was making double my salary from Kuwait, but I got this, we got this opportunity to work in this military type school and the boys, I loved them, but they were, you know, they were coming from public school into Mm -hmm. a private school and they were a little bit different, but I did love the boys. 
but I'm like, what am I doing? Like I was starting to, the reasons why I came overseas were not really that important anymore. I was going over to pay off college loans and to save up some money and to travel. Now I was looking at, okay, my parents are getting to be in their late sixties. Um, you know, I am missing community. I am missing nature. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that became, um, you know, deal breakers for me where I wasn't willing to sacrifice them anymore and be having a husband. My husband's like, you can go home if you want, I'm going to stay. So then I had that choice to make and, and for, and I hung on for four more years to make sure wow. I was absolutely clear that going home was the right thing because I knew I'd probably have to sacrifice my marriage. Yeah. And David ended up moving to the Philippines. He's now over there and he bought a house and, we tried to make a long distance relationship, see him when he came home in the summers in Canada. But I can tell you this, what ended up happening, that was about in 2015. By 2019, he asked for a divorce. We moved on within probably, and I was alone most of that time. So I had those three or four years to be on my own, which I needed to do. And then all of a sudden I walk, I signed the divorce papers within a couple months. I was at the gym and I happened to meet somebody and- wow. Yeah. And I think that alone time really helped me figure out what I wanted in life and who I was and what my values were I, and why I had come home. And, you know, I think that was really important. So starting over again without a husband, without a job, being on my own, I think really served me well in my life, especially, you know, my mid 40s. So, yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Sorry, the light actually turned off. <laughs> That's why you can't see my face right now. Um, but so you start over like what did you do next like you come back home and like how did you decide you know I'm this is like a new part of my life but like what's the next steps well you know the moment that I came home I had a I had a counselor I was trying to get pills to help like happy pills and mm -hmm. guitar to help me anxiety and depression mm -hmm. to help me you know and finally I had this counselor he was a Egyptian doctor in Qatar. And he goes, do you, do you need permission to go back home? Is that what you're looking for? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can't make this decision because I know what I'm going to lose. He goes, I am giving you permission. Wow. You, I am giving you permission to make the choice. So I made the choice. I ended up coming back home, um, you know, and I, I stayed, I moved in with my father because I, I had been without him for 13 years. So I moved wow. in with my father and I got a job right away within probably two weeks. So I knew it was the right way. I knew it was the right way, you know, at first, um, you know, and then I was on my own, David and I would see each other, like I said, in the summers, but yeah. I had that time to really think about what I wanted. And once I had the job, once I was around family again, once I was out in nature again, I was able to rebuild from the bottom up. And then I started a daily practice of praying in the morning before work, meditating in the morning before work, and having that quiet time on my drives and stuff and really asking for more signs. Now, where do I go from here? You wow. know? So it sounds like starting over, you really started at the basic fundamentals with yourself, like getting yeah. back to good with yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it was the best thing I ever did. Coming home was the heart. Once again, it was the hardest decision was sacrifice. Mm -hmm but it was the best decision that I ever made because I think I'm more stronger. I'm more confident. I'm happier. I was able to take the time to write a book. I think, you know, and I found the teaching job right away and I ended up dating, but the dating thing, I always tell people my life was quite fulfilling before I met somebody else. Like, and I wanted to be, I wanted to be happy and fulfilled before I met somebody. Right. And, and I think I attracted that kind of person to me because I was already happy. I was already fulfilled. I already had all these areas in my life that were going well. And then I could add him to my life, but he wasn't my whole life, right. you know? So right. I'm always very, very clear usually about that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very important distinction. Um, yeah. Jennifer, I, I've enjoyed this conversation. We're coming down to the end of our time. So let me ask okay. you the last couple of questions. Um, based on our conversation, I found two action items those two that we, we pulled out from the beginning, are there any more that you'd like to add besides five minutes of silence every day or so, and then asking the universe for signs? 
Yeah, I can add one more that really helped me when I started over again when I came back home is affirmations. I really had quite a low self-esteem when I first came home. I was feeling a lot of guilt about my separation from David. And I think what I needed was a little bit more of a support system in place to help me feel better about myself and more confident. So I really started doing some affirmations. And one of the affirmations I really loved was Louise Hay. And I think it's a 90 minute affirmation on YouTube where, you know, you start saying, I, I love myself, I am strong, I am confident, I am, and I would listen to that on the way to work. And it, it started to really make a difference in my life. Because even if I didn't believe it, I was saying it, and eventually I ended up believing it. So I would, I'm a big fan of affirmations, because even if you don't believe them right away, you end up believing them, they work magic on you. It's like positive talk for your soul. So oh. I really do believe in affirmations too. Yeah. Excellent. Awesome. I will get all three of those up in the show notes. Um, thanks again so much for being on the show. How can people reach out to you, support you, see what you're up to? Oh, I'd love for anyone to want to um, follow me. I'm on, um, I have a website, jenniferbensonauthor.com. It's a GoDaddy site. I have a lot of pictures from the tsunami. I have pictures of my teaching on there. I have some articles that I've written about following your inner ding, your inner voice. Um, so there's some great articles on there that I've written. And also Jennifer Benson Author on Facebook. And then I'm on Instagram, Jen Ben Writer, and Twitter, Jen Ben Writer. So those are all different ways that you can follow my journey. And yeah, so I would love to have that and have people follow me if they would like to. And yeah, perfect. So, awesome. Uh, yeah. I will get those up in the show notes as well. Uh, but thank you so much, Jennifer, again, for being on the show. I thought we had a really insightful conversation. Very interesting. Um, thank lots you. Of, lots of good points. So Thank you so much for having me on the show today. I really appreciate it. Yeah. It's been yeah. wonderful. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for listening to today's show. I really appreciate it. And I know that you will get excellent insights from today's show. If you, if you put it into action, that's the key. You got to put it into action. Do those action items. Really make changes in your life. Uh, some of the insights I have are not really worrying about all of the green lights being green, but just taking that next next step. I, I, I'm one that struggles with having to know everything from the beginning. And that's not how you can live life. So that's something I'm going to be working on. Uh, now, we'd like you to support the show. We'd, we'd like to invite you to help us out, keep this podcast going, help us get better guests, better content going. So there are a couple of things you can do. First thing, make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you never miss a single episode. We have episodes coming out on Mondays and Thursdays. On Thursday, you hear me and the co-host Ty Crockett put the action items into practice as well as taking on further challenges to give you examples of what it looks like to do hard things. So that's what you can do with subscribing there. Second thing, Show or share the show, sorry, share the show with someone you know who is struggling, or maybe they feel average or they're lost or, or something like that. But share the show with them and help them reach their goals and overcome average. And uh, if you are looking for someone to help you, then the best place to do that is The Forge. Now, you might be thinking The Forge is the name of our Thursday show, and you're right. But The Forge is also the name of a free community we created to help you connect with like-minded individuals who are trying to do hard things, as well as get uh, pushes and, and, and different challenges from us. So when you join The Forge, you actually get a couple of things. First of all, you get access to weekly challenges that go out exclusively to members of The Forge. You also get access to discounts on merchandise from the Hard Thing Podcast store, which is the hardthingpodcast.com slash shop. Last of all, you get access to live streamed podcasts, both Monday episodes and Thursday episodes. And, and be aware that I record Monday episodes well in advance of when they release. So you will get instant access to live stream episodes all for free just by joining The Forge at theforge.mn.co. Again, that's theforge.mn.co. It's free. Sign up. Band with like-minded individuals who can help you overcome average and step up above mediocrity. Now, I want you to think about something. Uh, wherever you've been in life, I would bet that there's nowhere you would rather not be than being a prisoner, right? Anyone would be anywhere else besides being a prisoner. Now add on to that fact that you would be abused if you were that prisoner. That sounds like a, a nightmare, really. Well, that's reality for some kids. Some kids are stuck 
in slavery. They're stuck in sex slavery, sex trafficking. And guess what? I want to invite you to help us put an end to it. So we want to talk to you about Operation Underground Railroad. So they're a nonprofit organization. They go undercover to rescue kids from sex trafficking. They're really good people. They do it for the right reasons. And we want you to invite us we want to invite you to help us help them. So join us in our campaign to raise $1,000 for them. Go to gofundme.com slash overcoming dash average. Donate even just $1. Help us get closer to that goal. And let's rescue rescue some kids. I know it was a great show today. I know you're ripping and roaring to go get some stuff done in your life. Start adventuring. So I'm going to leave you with this. Go out and do some hard things. Because you will overcome average. 